Hi, welcome to Grace Online. We're so glad you're joining us for this first Sunday in August. If you're living in New England and watching this, you know just how August-ish it has been. Hot, dry, no rain. My lawn is absolutely burnt to a crisp. But so is my neighbors, so it doesn't make me feel quite so bad about it. Well, if I had the, haven't had the chance to meet you or say hi, my name is Leah Knight Breton and I serve as a pastor of digital ministry here. And I'm so excited to be partnering with our new online campus pastor, John Kim. And for those of you who may have been wondering, is Leah still around? Is Leah okay? I am. I had taken on some of the online campus pastor responsibilities for an interim time with the hope of having someone step into that role in a more focused capacity. And I've also been taking a break from some of the upfront aspects of my role to work on some more behind the scenes needs for digital ministry. We've been working hard to build up our capacity for digital ministry as we prepare for the fall, as we smooth out our systems and processes. And I've really been using this time to listen really attentively to what God is doing in our midst and how the Spirit of God may be guiding our ministry in the digital space here at Grace. And also, if you're wondering what the difference is between an online campus pastor and a pastor of digital ministry, you're not alone. We actually get that question a lot. My role from the start of our digital ministry here at Grace is to creatively, strategically, and innovatively represent Grace's ministry as a whole in the online space, with the priority of engaging an increasingly disenfranchised and disillusioned community, asking questions like, how do we translate the best of our in-person ministry online? And how do we be the church in a way that speaks to and resonates with, with today's world and with people who aren't yet here? How can we be gospel or good news in the digital landscape? I'm excited to experiment this fall with some new ways for people to engage with God and this growing community. Pastor John's role as the online campus pastor is to cultivate this community just like a campus pastor at our in-person locations, but in the online space. So I'm honored to work alongside Pastor John and our amazing production team here as we help shape the future of our online ministry. If anything of what I've shared resonates with you, I'd love to hear from you. This is communal work we're doing and we'd love to hear from you and to have you be a part of it. You can email me at lnight@grace.org. Well, today we're continuing with our series on the book of James, Deep and Wise. And Pastor Brian is back with us and he'll be bringing us a message on one of the trickiest passages in James. I actually spent some time this week really wrestling with the text in anticipation of this message. And I know you'll be challenged by these words as I've been. We'll have a chance to share communion together after the message and Pastor John will be leading that time. So as we continue, hear this call to worship adapted from Psalm 36, five through seven. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountain. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. We celebrate your incredible love today. Amen. Amen.
One day, early in his ministry, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. John the Baptist was there and pointed him out to some of his followers. Look, he said, the Lamb of God. Well, two of them fell in behind Jesus and began following from a distance. At a certain point, the Gospel of John tells us, Jesus turned around, saw them following, and asked, What do you want? What do you want? What a question. Last week, Mike Hammond spoke to us about another question Jesus asked his followers, a question that Mike called the most important question of all. Who do you say that I am? Well, after getting past the fact that Mike had stolen my opening, <laughs> I realized that he had set me up beautifully for this week. Because if who do you say I am is the most important question of all, the most revealing question of all might be, what do you want? It's a simple question, but it's so provocative. It penetrates our defenses and our posturing. It exposes what's really going on inside of us, what we're after, what we're looking for, what we value. Many of us here today are Jesus followers or Jesus seekers. Suppose Jesus were to turn around and ask you today, what do you want? How might you answer? 
Well, some, some, some quick and maybe superficial answers come to mind. We want COVID to go away. We, we want inflation to come down. We want the temperature to come down a little bit anyway. If you're a Red Sox fan, you want the good old days back. But, but beneath the surface, deeper down, what do we really want as human beings? Well, a few things come to mind. We, we want happiness, right? For ourselves, for the people we love. Uh, not happiness in the, in the shallow sense of the word, but, but joy, contentment, satisfaction. But happiness seems harder to come by these days. Uh, one organization has been surveying Americans since 1972, asking if they would describe themselves as very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy. Well, for nearly 50 years, the very happy outnumbered the not too happy by about three to one. But in 2021, all that changed. The very happies plummeted to 19%, while the not too happy surged to 24%. Which means that for the first time in polling history, Americans are more likely to say they're not happy than to say they're very happy. And the numbers held across the board, rich, poor, men, women, Republican, Democrat. And that's too bad because deep down, we want to be happy. And, and we want love, don't we? Romance, friendship, family, community. We want to love and be loved, to belong, to have special people in our lives. But love and belonging have been harder to come by in recent years. COVID has isolated us from family and friends, made us nervous in some of the places we always felt comfortable. Culture and politics have divided us. Disrupting family reunions, straining friendships, forcing us into camps and tribes. We want happiness, we want love, and we want meaning, right? We want to know that our lives matter, that, that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. A LifeWay research study tells us that 57% of Americans say they wonder about meaning and purpose at least once a month. 27% say they wonder about it weekly, and 20% say they wonder about meaning and purpose every day. And those numbers are significantly higher than they were a decade ago. So we want a lot of things as human beings, superficial things and substantial things. But, but in the words of an unlikely theologian, you can't always get what you want. So what do you do then? And what happens when you get what you want, but still can't get no satisfaction? Not to quote that same unlikely theologian. If rock and roll is about anything, it's about wanting. And unfortunately, what often happens when we don't get what we want is that we start behaving badly. We try too hard. We go looking for love and meaning and happiness in all the wrong places. Uh, we start resenting and, and even attacking people who, who have what we want. And, and, and it leads to all manner of disappointment and harm and, and alienation. So clearly, we need some wisdom for all of this. And this summer, we're exploring the New Testament book called James. We're looking for a faith that's deep and wise, a faith that can handle the challenges of modern life and offer us a way through them that's good and beautiful and satisfying. Uh, so far, we've discovered wisdom for hard times, wisdom for difficult relationships, wisdom for handling power and wealth. Today, we're going to discover wisdom for our wants. What do we want? Where and how should we look for it? And how will we know when we found it? Well, let's jump into the middle of James' letter. Now, we're taking things a bit out of order as we work our way through this book. So today we find ourselves in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. 
Now, I should give you a heads up. These are some of the most hard-hitting and hard-to-interpret verses in the whole book and maybe in the whole New Testament. So, so to make sense out of it, we're, we're going to take a, a medical approach to James' message here. As we work our way through the passage, we'll talk about symptoms, diagnosis, prescription, and prognosis. So to paraphrase the old joke, I'm not a doctor, but sometimes I play one in the pulpit. So, so hang with me, and, and I think it'll all come together. Let's begin with the opening verses, one through three. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. <laughs> well, as usual, James doesn't pull any punches, right? I mean, it's clear from these opening lines that something has gone very wrong with these believers in their church. So, so let's begin by identifying their symptoms. That's the first thing any good doctor wants to know. And in the opening lines, James holds up that mirror he talked about back in chapter 1. And he lets his readers get a good look at themselves. And it's not a pretty sight. They're fighting with each other, quarreling and arguing. Now, most scholars agree they probably weren't literally killing each other. And most likely, James is, again, alluding to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as he often does in this letter. Uh, on, on that occasion, Jesus said, whoever is angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. So it appears these Christians were, were angry, getting verbally and maybe even physically violent with each other. Well, what were they fighting about? Well, James doesn't say specifically, but it seems like their wants were out of control. He says, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Now, to covet something is to want something, and in particular, to want what someone else has, and to want it so badly, you'll do whatever it takes to get it, even if it means taking it from them. And because they were so focused on what they wanted and what others had, they had completely taken their eyes off the good things that God wanted for them. They had forgotten what James told them earlier, that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. And when they finally did get around to asking God, they asked for the wrong things, things that weren't good for them. And they asked in the wrong way, selfishly and demandingly. So, so after all that striving and quarreling and coveting, the tragedy is that they ended up with none of the things that they really wanted. Now, how would you like to go to that church? <laughs> Remember, th these weren't a bunch of pagans James was writing to. These were Jesus followers, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we like to think we're in better shape than that, and hopefully we are. But maybe we should look just a little more closely in that mirror before we move on. Are we displaying some of these same symptoms? Have you ever watched someone drive out of the parking lot in a really nice car and wished it was your car? and maybe resented the fact that you work at least as hard as they do? Have you ever looked at someone else's Instagram post and wished their life was your life, and made some snarky comment about them to whoever happened to be with you at the moment? Have you ever canceled someone or, or spoken disparagingly of a brother or sister in Christ because of their political perspective or their cultural background? Have you ever taken matters into your own hands, financially, professionally, romantically, instead of trusting God to guide and provide? 
Something has gone wrong with our wants, James is telling us. And the symptoms are greed, envy, anger, strife, and, and dissatisfaction. And if we don't pay attention, those out-of-control wants can ruin our relationship with God and each other, leaving us more dissatisfied than ever. So let's press on a bit and, and get to the diagnosis. But we better brace ourselves because it's not good news. Let's go to verses 4 and 5. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? Well, the diagnosis, according to Dr. James, is, is worldliness. Don't you know, he says, that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Now, when the Bible talks about the world, it's not talking about planet Earth or the human race. Uh, well, we know from the creation account that, that the Earth is good, and that human beings are very good. God put us here on purpose to, to live our lives and enjoy the Earth in relationship with Him. Worldliness is simply leaving God out of the picture. Attempting to live our lives and enjoy this world apart from Him. Life without God, that's worldliness. Now, in the church world I grew up in, worldliness meant drinking and gambling and going to the movies and short skirts and rock and roll and mowing your lawn on a Sunday. The, the first time my parents took us to a movie, we went to the drive-in so no one could see us. In some church circles in those days, worldliness meant going to a secular university or trusting science or pursuing social causes. Now, thankfully, we have a more reasonable and balanced view of most of those things in the church today. But worldliness shows up in other ways. Our, our fascination with wealth and celebrity and success with political power and, and cultural respectability, with, with comfort and convenience. You see, worldliness is what we're left with when we go looking for happiness or love or meaning apart from God. It, it, it's money without contentment, work without real meaning, power without justice, sex without safety, Pleasure without joy, abundance without gratitude, knowledge without wisdom. Ultimately, worldliness is simply life without God. And that, that life never satisfies because we've separated ourselves from the giver of every good and perfect gift. And when we do that, James says, when we distance ourselves from God consciously or unconsciously, God, God is jealous for us. Now, I know that's a strange word to apply to God, but, but it's the word James uses. So, so let's try to see what he's after here. Now, we should point out that, that verse 5 is one of the most difficult verses in all of the Bible to translate in part because there are some textual variants in the ancient manuscripts, and in part because some of the words can have multiple meanings. There are no less than four possible translations of this one verse. I actually wrote a 20-page paper on this text back in seminary, and I'll spare you most of that. But I will tell you that I ended up where our new international version translators have, have landed in their most recent edition. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? 
James seems to be reminding his readers of Old Testament references to the jealousy of God. Verses like Exodus 34, 14. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord your God, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, what does that mean exactly? I mean, we typically use the word jealous in a negative sense to describe a suspicious or controlling or possessive kind of desire. And that kind of jealousy is destructive and unloving and unworthy of God. But the jealousy described here is a, is a pure, intense, all-encompassing desire for and delight in another person. I'm going to say that again. An all-encompassing desire for and delight in another person. God longs for us the way a lover longs for their beloved. And what God longs for is our true self. That's what James means by the spirit or, or the soul that he caused to live within us. God, God longs to know and be known by us, to share all of life with us, and for us to share all of ourselves with God. <laughs> Isn't that what a, what a husband or wife wants from and for their spouse? Isn't that what true friendship is all about? Sharing all of life with one another, being and sharing our true selves with each other. Now, that doesn't mean there's no room for other loves and other delights in our lives. Of course there are. And a loving God, like a loving spouse or a good friend, wants us to fully experience those loves and delights. But to do so in a way that deepens and enriches their relationship, our relationship. But when those other loves and delights begin to distract or detract from our love for and delight in our beloved, when we, del when we delight in the gifts but not the giver, something has gone wrong with the relationship. And, and so our jealous God reaches out to rescue us, to call us back into the relationship from which all good things flow. So th that's why every attempt to satisfy our wants apart from and outside of our relationship with God always come up short. When we leave God out of our finances, our, our careers, our family life, our friendships, our hobbies, our entertainment, they'll never satisfy the way they were intended to because they were meant to be pursued, meant to be experienced in relationship with the God who loves us and gave them to us in the first place. One commentator puts it this way. God desires with all of his heart for us to come home and to live with him and in him and to ask for his wisdom. So, before we rush to James' prescription for all of this, let's just pause for a minute and ask ourselves if there are aspects of our lives that, that God might be jealous of, not, not in a controlling way, but, but in a relational way. Are there activities or pursuits or relationships that, that we're not inviting God into, that we're not experiencing in relationship with Him? I don't know about you, but I'm surprised how, how often and easily I do that. Make plans, make decisions, spend money, handle relationships, go on a trip, do my work, without intentionally inviting God in, without humbly asking for wisdom, until I've hit a dead end or, or made a mess of things. But when that happens, James says, when we start doing life without God, drifting further and further from Him, it calls for drastic action. And that's what he's going to describe in his next section. So let's jump down to verses 7 through 10 and discover Dr. James' prescription for a worldliness. Now, it's pretty tough medicine, but it works. 
verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Well, like I said, pretty tough stuff, right? I mean, we've already noted James' lack of bedside manner. He's got his Old Testament prophet on here. He's channeling John the Baptist, and his prescription in a word is repentance. Now, now, we, we know what repentance means. It means turning around, turning away from worldliness and turning toward God. James actually breaks it down into 10 commands here. Uh, let's walk, walk through them, and, and you can count them as we go. One, submit to God. If, if you've been resisting God's love and leading in some area of your life, <laughs> get on your knees and surrender it to his loving lordship in your life. Two, resist the devil. Now, we don't have time for a big theology lesson here, but, but, but to put it in plain language, if, if Satan has been sitting on your shoulder, whispering lies and accusations in your ear, flick them away. Start listening to God instead. I went out on the porch the other night just before going to bed, looking up at the sky, and I, and I sensed the enemy messing with my head, stirring up thoughts and feelings that weren't good for me or others. And I almost gave into it, but... But then I thought about this text, actually, and I said out loud on my porch, get out of here, Satan. Turned and went back inside with, with a renewed sense of partnership with God. Sometimes you just have to do that. Number three, come near to God. James is describing a worshiper approaching the temple, approaching the altar with a sacrifice or an offering. So if, if, if you've been drifting from God, consciously or unconsciously, turn around, James is saying. Make a beeline right back to God. Four, wash your hands. If there's some ugly, unholy habit or behavior you've been hanging on to, get some spiritual soap and water and wash your hands of it. Now that, that might mean confessing it to someone. It might mean getting some help with it. Truth-telling can be cleansing. Number five, purify your hearts. If you're, if you're harboring some ugly or unholy attitude in your heart, throw it out. Invite the Spirit to come and take up residence there. Grieve, mourn, and wail. That's six, seven, and eight all together. If if you've been callous to the things that break God's heart, if, if you've been unmoved by the pain that others are experiencing, then it's time to start weeping over the evil in this world and the brokenness in our own lives. Nine, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. If you've been distracting yourself from things that really matter, Maybe it's time to, to get serious and do something with the one and only life that God has given you. And 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. If, if you think you're doing pretty well compared to everyone else, maybe it's, maybe it's time to fall flat on your face and say, have mercy on me, Lord, sinner. Well, like I said, it's pretty strong medicine. Do whatever it takes, James is saying, to restore or renew your life with God. I mean, that's what you would do if, if your marriage was in trouble, right? If, if a friendship was floundering, if a child was drifting from you. In love, you would, you would reach out. You would do whatever it takes to get that relationship back on track. 
I, I don't know what that might mean for you, practically speaking, but, but chances are there's something God's Spirit is, is prompting you to do. Maybe, maybe it's time to, to re-examine your work life and the good things you might be sacrificing in, in pursuit of success. And maybe you need to recalibrate the stewardship of your time or your talents or your treasure. Are you using them for God's purposes or yours? Maybe it's time to finally reach out to that person or, or get involved with that cause that God keeps bringing to your mind. I think it's safe to say that, that, that COVID and the past couple of years have, have knocked many of us out of our normal rhythms and, and practices for, for nurturing our relationship with God. Maybe it's time we do something about that. Maybe it's time to, to reclaim your daily time with God. Maybe it's time to get re-engaged with, with your church. I'm not just watching or attending for an hour, which is a good start, but, but connecting with a group of people, finding a place to serve, inviting someone to join you. Almost every week these days, as I as I visit campuses and uh, connect with people online, I'm finding people who are just finding their way back to worship, to group life, to, to ministry. I'm back, they say. <laughs> and it, they smile as they say it, and, and it brings a smile to my face. And I think it brings a smile to God's face. Wisdom tells us to do whatever it takes to restore or renew or rediscover our life with God. Whatever it takes. When, when, I, when I wrote that phrase, it, it brought to my mind a, a cool song by Imagine Dragons from a few years ago. I think James would have liked it too. It's got that, that, that same intense driving urgency that, that we find in this passage. Whatever it takes, the chorus goes, because I love the adrenaline in my veins. I do whatever it takes, because I love how it feels when I break the chains. Whatever it takes, yeah, take me to the top. I'm ready for whatever it takes. The songwriter wants more out of life. He wants fullness and freedom and significance, and that's good. That's what we were made for. The only thing I would say to him is, don't leave God out of the picture. God wants those same things for you, for all of us. But God wants us to experience those things together for our good, for the good of the world. Well, uh, like I said, it's a pretty hard-hitting message. It is not an easy text to preach or to hear, I imagine. A lot had gone wrong for the believers and the churches that James was writing to, and, and, and maybe for us too. The symptoms are every sort of dissatisfaction. The diagnosis is, is worldliness, doing life without God. The prescription is repentance, turning back to God. But, but what's the prognosis, Dr. James? Is there any hope for, for these believers and for us? And it turns out the prognosis is pretty good. Listen again to what we can expect if we follow James' wisdom. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, James says. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And the best news we actually skipped over back in verse 6. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. He gives us more grace. You know what grace is? Undeserved favor. Surprising goodness. God is so jealous for you that all you have to do is take a step in God's direction 
and God will take two steps toward you, three or four. In fact, all you have to do is turn toward God, like that prodigal son turning toward home, and God will come running to meet you. And he'll bring with him the things you truly want. Overwhelming joy, perfect love, ultimate meaning. And, and that's the prognosis if we, if we follow James' wisdom. Overwhelming joy, perfect love, ultimate meaning. Overwhelming joy is happiness that transcends our circumstance. Love that's unconditional and irreversible. Meaning, no matter what life brings our way. Because our jealous God is for us and with us, now and forever. Once again, James is simply echoing the words of Jesus when he, when he told a crowd of anxious people gathered on that hillside, people who were worrying about all the things they needed and wanted in life. And Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. I don't know what's stirring inside of you right now. At the beginning of the message, I ask you to imagine Jesus turning around and asking you, what do you want? Whatever it is, if it's something good and beautiful and true, you can and will find it in relationship with the God who made you, loves you, and put you on this earth for a purpose. So may you and I and we do whatever it takes to restore, renew, or rediscover our life with God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your incredible love for us and for all the good and perfect gifts you've given us to enjoy and steward in relationship with you. Forgive us, Lord, when we leave you out of the picture, when we try to get what we want apart from you. Help us, Lord, today, this week, this season, to do whatever it takes to invite you into our lives, to experience life with you, to rediscover the joy of living every day in relationship with you. And may we do this for our joy, for your glory, and for the good of the world. Amen. in 
the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God Cause your goodness is running after it's running after me Your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give it One of the ways we draw near to God is through communion. Because knowing that he was about to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, Jesus tells his disciples whom he's journeyed with for several years to break bread and to drink the cup in remembrance of him. And so as we partake in this meal together, we draw nearer to his presence. The scripture tells us on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this blood, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's take a moment of silence to just be in his presence. God, we thank you that you give us opportunities like this to pause and to be reminded of your love for us and the ways in which you've given us life. And so as we take in this meal together, will we draw closer to you and will we be reminded of your nearness to us? And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much for joining us today and joining us in being reminded of the love of our God. Go in peace.